Hey guys, here we go. Homecoming by Cynthia Voigt, part two, chapter four. They slept late the next morning and were wakened by the roar of a racing motorboat as it headed down, headed down the river to the bay. They were all, even Sammy, shoved out of sleep into the hot morning like falling out of bed. Dicey raised her face from her poncho. Her cheek was damp with sweat. Her thighs stuck to the rubber. She rubbed at her eyes. The woods rested behind them. The water on the opposite shore lay be before them. Between these wandered the narrow river. The sun was high in the sky, high and hot. They all peed in the woods, then gathered fuel for a small fire. Dicey pulled the five fish out of the water. With the jackknife, she gutted them and scraped off some of their scales. Then she and James threaded them onto supple branches. Nobody spoke. They ate the fish and finished the milk and bread. James experimented with toasting the bread on a stick. He got a patchwork piece of toast, splotches of white, splotches of black, and various shades of brown. Dicey gathered the underwear almost dry from the bushes where it had been hanging all night. James taught Sammy how to put out a fire properly, to cover it with dirt and then stamp on it and wait, to be sure that no, tell no telltale smoke rose up from the ashes. Maybeth helped Stacy fold up the ponchos and pack them into her bag. They gathered all their garbage into the brown grocery bag. Stacy knew it was time to go, but she didn't want to start. Not yet. She pulled out her map and studied it. They would go through Easton and then loop west. Daisy would have preferred to stick to the water's edge, to follow the shoreline down, but this countryside had too many fists and fingers of land that reached out into the water. If they followed the shoreline, they would travel many miles more than they had to, winding in and out along the paths at the points of land. At the sound of another motor, they all froze. A small boat, really just a rowboat with an outboard, chugged downriver. Three boys were in it, all about James's age. They were tanned by the sun, all wore cutoffs, t-shirts, and sneakers. Their hair looked shaggy as if it hadn't been cut all summer. They trailed lazy hands in the water as they moved slowly, aimlessly, down the river and out of sight. You know, Daisy said, they look like us, don't they, James? He nodded. His eyes followed the wake the little boat left behind. Do you think we're like most of the kids over here, in the way we look, Daisy asked? Natural camouflage, James said. Daisy looked at them. They were all tan, and her day in the sun yesterday had caught her up in brownness for what she'd lost during hours inside at Bridgeport. Their hair was scruffy, and Maybeth's curls looked tangled, but they didn't look out of place or unusual. They looked like kids running a little wild during the summer. They returned to the road, hurrying down the dirt driveway. James carried the bag of trash and dumped it into a garbage can near the little store Dicey had shopped in the afternoon before. The clock within the store wrote red 10, late. The children walked on beside the highway. This was Route 33, heading east. In Easton, they would change roads to go south. Traffic was light on this hot summer morning. They walked two by two on the shoulder of the road. Fields of corn hedged them in. Insects buzzed among the rows. Daisy wondered if they could take a few ears for supper. Her pan wasn't big enough to hold a whole ear of corn. But you could scrape off the kernels. Her curiosity was aroused by these fields, so unprotected from the road. Anybody could go in and steal the corn. There were no fences to stop them. Maybe that was why she didn't want to do it. As they neared the town of Easton, they began to pass shopping centers and development houses, little low one-story ranchers with sprigs of new grass and one or two puny trees. At one of the large markets, Stacy bought a pie on sale and four bananas. They cost 92 cents. She told her family that they would stop to eat after they had passed through Easton. Sammy wanted to stop before the town. It takes all day to get through a place. Not a little one like this, Dicey said. Are you sure? Pretty sure, Dicey said. Want to bet? They'd wager an hour's fishing time. If it took too long to get through Easton, Dicey would have to fish for an hour while Sammy had free time. If it didn't, then Sammy would have to fish an extra hour. Sammy liked this. Either way, he won. He walked eagerly on. Dicey won the wager, of course. As she said to herself, if she couldn't read a map by now, she'd be a pretty sore fool. The, ed the streets of, of Easton, even the main arteries that they walked on, were sleepy, tree-lined roads. The tallest buildings reached only four stories. Stop signs outnumbered traffic lights. Their roads took them around the town rather than through its center. They passed by a long pond that ran behind the YMCA and then down across abandoned railroad tracks to where a big highway joined up with 322. Here, Dicey took out her map again. Route 50, a four-lane highway with a grass divider. 
Trucks, cars, campers, buses, vans, pickups, motorcycles, all thundered down the highway, hard on one another's heels, traveling fast. Daisy wanted to get off this road for two reasons. First, it was too heavily traveled, and the air was thick with fumes and noise. Second, Route 50 went due south to Cambridge before bearing east to Salisbury. It would be quicker to take a road that followed the third side of the triangle formed by Easton, Cambridge, and Salisbury. A river lay across that route, the Chop Tank. It was broad down by Cambridge, but now we're up above, and it would be easy to cross, she guessed, remembering the little river they'd camped by. She decided to turn off the main highway and cut cross-country. A quarter of a mile south of Easton, she took a turn onto River Road. That had the right sound to it. They crossed the highway at a run. They raced across the southbound lanes, then had to wait several minutes before they could dash safely across the northbound traffic. Daisy saw fields ahead and a few houses. Twenty yards from the highway, they were back in open countryside. It was James who sighted the circus ahead, set up on a fallow field. He saw the Ferris wheel. Let's go there and eat, he said. We can't spend any money, Dicey said. That's okay, I like to look, James answered. They ate the bananas as they approached the circus. They came to it from the rear, from behind a big tent. A short midway with a Ferris wheel and carousel and a dozen booths for games and food stands led away from the tent entrance. People were hurrying around, setting up games, carrying boxes marked with the names of soft drinks. A man tinkered with the engine that drove the Ferris wheel. Daisy stopped by a trash can. She broke the pie into four pieces and handed them out. They dropped their garbage into the metal barrel. They stared for a while at the activity on the midway and then drifted back to the tent from which music and various voices issued. Do you think they have elephants? Sammy asked Daisy. Doesn't look big enough, she said. I don't see any place where they'd keep animals. Do you, James? It doesn't look like much of a circus. James peered into the tent, standing in the doorway. There's a tightrope, he reported. Out, ordered a sharp voice from the dimness within the tent. The Tillermans backed away. You heard me. A woman stepped out into the bright, hot sunlight. She had bright red hair and wore a man's shirt over tight blue jeans. She wore sandals with very high heels. She carried a whip. Three terriers, like little white mobilized mops, swirled around her feet in eager circles. Somehow, she managed not to step on them or trip over them. What are you kids doing here, she demanded. She sounded angry, angry at them. Nothing, Dicey said. Tell that to the Marines, she said. You know we don't open till six. No, we didn't. You do now, she answered. She put her hands on her hips and glared at them. The whip dangled down and one of the little dogs, the one with the pink ribbon on its head, jumped up to grab it out of her hand. The woman rocked on her heels and the dogs ran off in a row, the other two chasing the one carrying the whip. Daisy started to smile. You heard me, the woman said. Or should I call the police? I don't think so. A slow, thick man's voice spoke from behind the Tillermans. Daisy turned to face this new person. He was a tall black man with eyes so dark brown they looked almost black beneath thick eyebrows. He was clothed entirely in black, a black shirt and black pants and high black leather boots. His tightly curling hair was cut short, and he had a narrow, short beard along his jawbone. His face looked relaxed, as if nothing could upset him. Maybeth moved closer to Dicey. James stood where he was, his mouth open. Sammy was poised to run. The man spoke again. Relax, kid. She won't hurt you. Claire, what is this? They were snooping around, the woman told him. This one, she indicated Dicey. He said they didn't know we're closed until six. You go back to work, the man told her. I'll take care of this. They waited while she whistled for the dogs and then walked off back into the tent. We are off limits until the show opens, the man told the Tillermans. We really didn't know, Dicey said. Then you're strangers around here. His eyes studied her. Dicey nodded. Looking at his calm face with its studying eyes, she said what she was thinking. Strangers about everywhere. He looked quizzically at her. She had no cause to be angry, Dicey said. He nodded. I apologize for that. Claire's got a bad temper, but that's no excuse. Believe it or not, she's a good friend, a good person to have on your side. We owe you an apology, too, Dicey answered. Even if we didn't mean to, we did trespass. I'll see you out, he said. You came through the back? Where are you going if you don't live in Easton? South, Dicey said. Where are you from? North. The man stopped two strides ahead of them and turned to look at them all. His leather boots creaked a little. The tillerman stood in a row, facing him. Are you okay, he asked. Yeah, Dicey said. You're not a boy, the man said, walking beside them now. He had a little smile hovering around his mouth. No, I'm not, Dicey agreed. Do you own this circus, James asked. Yep, he said. 
Why? James asked. It's my living. Name's Will, by the way. I like moving around, following the good weather. I wouldn't think you'd make any money, James observed. Why not? Will asked. It's so small. That's right enough, Will agreed. Still, his warm voice drifted off without finishing the sentence. As, as At the road, he said goodbye. Good traveling, he said to Dicey. Thanks for rescuing us, Dicey said. You didn't need help, he answered. Take care. You too, Dicey said. Oh, I do. You can believe I do, he said. He turned back with a wave, and the Tillermans walked away. They were silent for a long time, each thinking his own thoughts in the steamy afternoon. The road wound through farm country. Here the farms were large. Several fields separated one farmhouse from another. The fields were flat. The farmhouses had only a few trees near them. Big barns and many sheds lay behind the houses. They were prosperous farms, you could tell, because the barns gleamed with fresh red paint and the houses often had swimming pools out front. Finally, James broke the silence. She probably figured she could be angry and mean to us and get away with it, he said, because of her kids. She didn't get away with it, Dicey reminded him. Sammy, you were ready to run, weren't you? I didn't know what she'd do, Sammy explained. She said she'd call the police. That was smart, Dicey said. But, James started to say, and then he stopped. They walked on and sang as they walked. They passed fields and more fields. Some of them had been picked bare. Some of the farms had cardboard signs posted at their mailboxes. Pickers wanted. At a crossroads, Dicey went to a general store and bought potatoes and tomatoes, a quart of milk, and another loaf of bread. She also bought two Cokes and cans because she was thirsty. All these cost $2.35, except for the $40 she didn't want to spend. She was almost out of money. They shared the Cokes. We could pick for a day or two, she said to her family, and get some money. Do we need money, James asked. Of course, Dicey said. I've got some set aside in case we have to go back to Bridgeport. I don't want to spend that. So we're not out of money, but we need more. Would they hire kids, James asked. We could try, Dicey said. Are you game to try? Could you pick for a day, Sammy? Sure, Sammy said. Dicey grinned at him. I believe you could, she said. I'll try, Maybeth volunteered. I guess so, James said. Not today, though, Dicey said. Today, there's a creek up a ways, or down a ways. I thought we'd camp by that and fish. Somebody has a couple of fishing hours, Otis. I will not say who. It's me, Sammy cried, because I lost the bet. It's me. As they approached the creek, Dicey had seen on the map, only the map called it a river, the land developed a few gentle rises. These were not hills like they'd found in Connecticut, not high, sharp hills. They were gentle roundings, mere ripples in the land. In contrast to the flat land all around, however, they stood up. Here there were hardwood trees, sycamores, and maples, and oaks, as well as the pines that grew everywhere. The road went over the little creek, and the Tillermans turned off the road, following the creek's dry banks until they judged they were far enough from road and farmhouse. Sammy dug a few worms and set himself to fishing. James and Dicey gathered wood for a fire. Maybeth spread out the ponchos under the green trees as best she could. There wasn't room for more than two of them because of the roots and bushes in the creek bed. When everything was ready and they had only to wait for Sammy to catch something, Dicey and James and Maybeth went downstream to wade and wash. Sammy watched them go without a word. He stood very quiet in the center of the narrow creek, letting the water splash at his hips, holding the fishing line out from his hands. The late afternoon wore away into early evening. Dicey came back and started the fire. Sammy had caught nothing and reported no nibbles. He was not quite ready to quit trying, he said. Dicey shoved the potatoes into the fire. The skins would burn, maybe, but she didn't think she could get a pot of water boiling on the small fire she felt safe building. They ate potatoes, tomatoes, and bread for supper and passed around the carton of milk. There was enough food to fill them, and they kept back some bread and milk for breakfast. James put out the fire using dirt, not water, because water would make more smoke. The sun was going down then. It grasped at the land with long yellow fingers and made the mottled trunks of sycamores look like people's skin. Flocks of birds made their evening journeys home, twittering to one another. Far off, an occasional motor sounded. The Tillermans lay sprawled around the creek at their feet and the slate hillside behind them. Clouds strayed across the darkening sky. You know, Dicey said, we don't have to go anywhere. We could always travel like this, following the warm weather like Will said he did. We can take care of ourselves. Yeah, but what's the point, James said. There doesn't have to be a point, Dicey said. Just doing it, like sailing. 
We have to go home, Maybeth said. Home? We don't have a home, Dicey said. I thought we were going to Mama's home, Maybeth said. Is that our home too, Sammy asked? I don't know, Dicey said. That's what we're trying to find out, I guess. Oh well, she said. I guess you're right, James. I mean, you have to go to school. So do you, he grinned at her. So do we all. We're going to grow up. We have to. I know, I know, she said. If it was Mama's home, it has to be ours too, Maybeth said. We have this grandmother there, Dicey answered, but we can't tell what she'll think of us, what she'll want. Mama never talked about her, Dicey pointed out. Yes, she did, Sammy said, but it made her sad. She'd cry. Is that right? What did she say? I can't remember, only the sadness. I'm sorry, Dicey. That's okay. I don't know. I didn't know Mama ever said anything about her. I just don't know what to expect there. Whatever, James said, we can take care of ourselves, wherever. I know an old lady who swallowed a fly, Dicey chanted. They sang all the silly songs they knew until darkness had gathered around them. Then they lay down close together and went gently to sleep. Thanks for watching, you guys. I hope you're enjoying. Um, I will be back probably tomorrow with chapter five of part two. And again, I hope you're really enjoying the book as much as I'm enjoying reading it to you and sharing it with you. Please give this video a thumbs up if you feel so inclined. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. And hit the bell icon so that you don't miss any of my future uploads. Have a great rest of your night, guys. And I will be back soon with more stuff. Bye.